to start with Rukmini. Um, last time when I got here, I was wondering what uh, is it about India that we can actually share here in Africa. But for those of you who were there at dinner last night, it seemed to me that the minister laid out the agenda completely. And if I wasn't uh, listening carefully, I would have thought that everything he said was applicable to India. So I'm very glad that I'm still relevant. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, many of the things that, uh, at least in our session, we are going to talk about are you know, big problems, and people are hunting you know, for solutions. So I'm going to spend a little while, I think, laying out the problem, not because many of you don't recognize it, but I think it's still not given the adequate attention in policy circles, and uh, therefore for allocations and for action and so on. Um, the, the fact is that enrollment levels are very high in elementary school in most countries. Uh, there seem to be that most governments are looking at who's out of school and trying to do something about it. But once children are in school, we all seem to relax, and uh, which kind of negates the whole purpose for being in school. And uh, it's, that seems to be the case, certainly in India, but in large parts of you know Africa as well. Uh, when there are actually discussions on um, what happens once you're in school, uh, I find it very interesting that, uh, again, I'm not familiar with the discussions in Africa, but in India, it all becomes very vague, and we start talking about again how quality means many things to many people, and therefore, perhaps we are also paralyzed because we can't come up with a kind of a concrete, articulate definition of what the problem is. So, in the work that we do in India, <clears throat> we've tried to define the problem in a very straightforward way. Partly because I don't think the problem is that complicated, and partly because we have a large number of people in India who need to identify with the problem. So, having very broad and vague definitions of problems also means that people can't participate in understanding the problem. So when we talk about, firstly, in the, what we talk about here, at least what I talk about here, is basically about learning in school. And in learning, we're focusing on very basic levels, ability to read, ability to do simple arithmetic. Because if you don't have those in place in time, the whole education edifice you know, uh, is likely to crumble. Um, so to give you an example, if you can't read it, how many people can read this? Don't worry. <laughs> Most people in India can't read it either. So, you, uh, so here is just an example of what do we mean by learning. I'm using an example of reading, and uh, you know the way we uh, you know kind of came up with this assessment tool. That's a long story which I won't tell you. But basically, there are letters, there are simple everyday words. This paragraph of four lines is what is usually found in India in textbooks at the first. So by the end of your first year in school, you should be able to read the simple sentences. And then by second grade, you're expected to read a slightly longer text. And many second grade textbooks actually in India are harder than this. But we feel that this is a fairly good definition of what reading is. And uh, if you're illiterate, like you all are, despite <laughs> being from premier education institutions of the world, uh, you can still identify that uh, visually that the thing on the on the right hand side is actually more complicated than what is here. So this tool has actually helped us a great deal, not only in, defi you know, in devising instructional strategies, but also in getting illiterate parents to engage with what this issue of learning is. So uh, very often in villages when you're actually asking children to read, you have parents coming up and saying, so this is what should be happening in school. We know things are not good, but we didn't know exactly what the problem is. Because once somebody reads this out to you, you can see it's a very, very simple you know, set of stuff. So this is, this is sort of the, the tool by which you can uncover the problem. Now let's look at what is the, how, how big is this problem? How deep is this problem? And um, I don't know, can you see this at the back? So this is an a, a analysis of reading levels across India. It comes from a uh, source uh, which is called the Annual Status of Education Report, which as Pratham we bring out every year. It's a very large survey done in the household. It's a representative of children at the district level. We have about 600 districts in India. And the sample size behind this is about 700,000 children. So we are a big country, so we have big problems. <laughs> but not all problems are very complicated. And so what this shows us is that in grade five, uh, and the, the table is organized according to the tool that you just saw. 
And you can, children are uh, put into different categories which are mutually exclusive. So whatever is the highest reading level that you achieve, that's where you're at. So you can see that after five years in school, in fifth grade, only 53% of kids can read the second grade level. Which means that half the children who reached fifth grade, they've reached fifth grade as in moving through school, but they haven't yet reached a second grade level. Apparently from other estimates across Africa, the numbers are vary, but in some countries are worse. Very similar data to this, we, we have this for five years, and anybody who's at university is here, we would welcome, and if you're interested in India, we would welcome you to use this data. 700,000 kids, five years, and likely to continue for another, another five years. Uh, there are three countries in East Africa who have come up with these similar estimates in Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Tanzania. And there, this effort in India is called ASAR. In uh, East Africa, it's called OESO. And apparently, Mali and maybe Senegal will try to attempt to do something like this. But it is a big problem, deep problem. Lots of money being spent on schooling, not getting much. Just for us, the scale, just in case you were not worried, here's a little bit more. We have a million government schools. We have 200 million children. 50% cannot read at different levels, which means 100 million children in India alone need help today. And in terms of enrollment, the latest figures are that 96.3% of all our children are enrolled in school. As Indian citizens, we pay a 2% education tax which we, we as Indian citizens play un, pay uncomplainingly to the government, and the government is not even able to tell us how our children are doing. So we poor Indian citizens also have to do surveys to figure that out. <laughs> uh, so this is the, um, what about policies? Since I know that you want to affect policy, uh, if I look at international and national goals, MDG goals, very clear about universal enrollment, completely silent about what the school should guarantee. Not sure who makes these policies, but if you know them, please tell them, it's a big mistake. Uh, in India, our national goals also refer to enrollment, retention, and reduction of all kinds of gaps. Uh, again, big focus on access and on enrollment. On the learning side, our goals, and I've put, actually taken a few of the words out of our policy documents, and I often say that in this um, education of satisfactory, quality, relevant for life, other than the two words off and for, you can probably argue with every other word, long workshops and seminars to debate what this should be. So again, it means we don't have a clear definition. In addition, we now have a right to education in India, which has been passed by our parliament last year, which also says nothing about guaranteeing learning. It guarantees schools, it guarantees a certain type of teacher, it guarantees you a playground, your desks, you know, other things, but for some reason, we in India are very reluctant to say what we want for our children. I'm hoping that in Africa people are much braver, and it seemed to me from your minister's speech that certainly they are clearer. Uh, so we have numbers, we have measurements of enrollment across the board from village to country to everywhere. Um, our government measures learning, but those are done very periodically, certainly not done at the level at which planning and action is, uh, you know, is done and they're quite difficult to understand. So this is where we are on the policy front. And I just wanted to just, uh, just the final one, this word big stuff comes from Land Pritchett, who some of you may know, that you know here are some learning curves. So the curves that you see for the percentage of children in different grades, I have three, four, five, and six, and what is the percentage of children in these grades in India who can actually read at second grade level? And the lines are from all the way from 2006 to 10, very large samples. And you can see more or less across the last five years, they have not moved. If you look at the red line, which is a line that I created, you can create your own. What I say, it says that I want by grade three, at least half the children to read at grade two level. Our uh, government establishment actually attacked me on this and said, you have to want much more. So, fine, we can want much more, but here's where the children are at. And if you say that every country needs to have a desired level about where you're headed, I have one line, you can have some other lines. But the question is, how do we move from the lines we are at to the lines where we want to be? And what are we going to do year on year, whether for a province or for the country or for a district or for a school or for a village, to make sure that year on year we want to move ahead? And I think that's what our whole panel is about. 
as to how to get out of the big stuck. Because if we remain here, I can see that as we go on, both in terms of growth or equity, we will be really stuck. And all this investment that's going into schools is going to lead to not much. <laughs> okay, so what can be done? Many things obviously can be done, and I'm going to just put out for you, uh, uh, as Pratham, we've tried a large number of things on scale over the last 10 years, but the ones I've put out here are also the ones that we've had evaluations for. And really, I think it comes down to saying, you know, sort of, what's your theory of change? What do you think needs to happen to change, you know, going towards what? So, one uh, feeling is schools don't have resources, they don't have extra time, they don't have extra people, so will bringing in some of these extra things help? Second issue, and at last time, there were some discussions around these. Parents have not been to school themselves, they don't know what to do. If they had more information, could the information help? Teachers, not adequately equipped, could teacher training help? And finally, if all mothers had gone to school, would that mean that children won't have a problem afterwards? So these are, I mean, there could be many more. These are some that I'm just putting out. Uh, just now to bring evaluations and programs, this is again a kind of an evolution of what Pratham has done. And so, you know, starting off in the early part of, uh, you know, the, I guess the last decade, we started working with uh, different sets of techniques and methods and organizing children. And at that point, uh, we were working with, you know, close to 200,000 children. And at that time, we had a study. And I realized I just checked with Esther and Abhijit. I guess we've been working for, with them before they were actually called PAL or JPAL. <laughs> so at that point, it was Esther and Abhijit. Now it's like a massive institution. Uh, but we then had a study that actually followed what we were doing programmatically and tried to look at what the uh, difference would be. We moved on a couple of years. And by that time, the, the first one was uh, urban. We were very urban in our early years. We then moved to rural areas, and we were working at that point around the middle of the last uh, decade in about 120 districts. A district in India is about anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 schools, and each school on average in India is about 200. So we were working fairly large scale, and that's when we had another study that we looked at in terms of what things can happen in the village. I'll go into more detail later. And finally, you know, the most recent evaluation uh, that has happened is for a program that we have called Read India. Read India is a very large campaign in partnership with many state governments. In India, education is a school education is a, is a state subject. So the partnerships have to be with state governments. And uh, you know, Read India program at its peak reached about half of all of India's districts. And so we had also a evaluation going on uh, uh, to look at the effectiveness of some of the things we were trying. So I just put this here to say that as we have evolved, and it's not a question of one intervention and one evaluation, but I think that what we have been able to together do is to have a kind of a decade-long evolution of programs accompanied by a decade-long you know, sets of evaluations. And the links between these, I think, are, you know, people like to think you do a study, then you have results, then you scale up. I think the story is actually much richer than that and that there are links that feed across different uh, evolutions of programs and the uh, learnings that you have from evaluations. Um, I know Annie will talk much more, so but I just want to take you a little bit through the details. So the first one, we had in-school kind of pull-out remedial classes run by uh, years. And I've put down some of the things here, because once you actually get to wanting to do something similar somewhere else, it's the devil is in the details. The big picture people agree with, but exactly what are you going to do? So we had two uh, uh, volunteers. The word in Hindi means Bal Sakhi, which is a child's friend. Uh, and uh, this was a program within school, during school hours, focused on kids in grade three and four who were way behind. And uh, the study lasted for two years, two different cities, and um, uh, you know, uh, two different languages as well. I won't go into the design, because maybe Andy will, but we learned a lot of things during these two years. And uh, uh, these lessons often to us, during the process of doing the evaluation and program together, have been the most important things that we as practitioners take away from the partnership. 
One is that we found that as soon as there was extra help in the schools, often teachers would give all the children to the helpers, <laughs> thereby actually negating the whole purpose as to why they were there. But this extra help was sometimes very welcomed and for the wrong reasons. The second was that despite where the kids were, uh, there was a great concern within all uh, layers of the education system about what happens to the regular curriculum. As if the curriculum is a sacrosanct holy cow that has to be worshipped, even if all your worshippers are actually very ineffective worshippers. Uh, the third one was that there was no engagement because this was an in-school from parents and from community members who themselves, as I pointed out, uh, you know, were not very educated themselves. Uh, the next one, some of the learnings from here, some of the other experiences we were having. The next uh, intervention evaluation combination actually looked at what would happen if people knew more about the problem. So we had three different interventions. One was to get people together to talk. And we did this actually not even at a village level, but at a, at a sub-village level because most Indian villages are not one big village, but they are hamlets, which are more homogenous as hamlets rather than a whole village. The second intervention was the first, plus actually creating the kind of report card that I just showed you for the hamlet itself, thereby thinking that if you were able to generate your own information and saw the problem for your own kids right there, whether this would lead to some action. And the third intervention was the first and second, plus a actual demonstration of how you could help kids learn to read by using community volunteers. So these were the three interventions. Again, I won't go into what the, the findings were. The lessons we learned were that only the third one made a difference. And that even though as Indians we are big talkers, only action was compelling. And all the talk that you saw and all the meetings, we would have village meetings in village after village where 200 people would attend. And there would be hours.